Hello, Paul Beckwith, University of Ottawa, Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. So, in the last video, I talked about population, all about population, global population and growth. And uh, this is the, if you just Google global population clock, you come up with this worldometer and the current world population. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue off um, where I was before in this um, presentation from the Canadian Population Institute. Madeline Weld gave this talk. Um, I want to uh, slideshow, continue from current slide. Okay, so she gave this talk at the Canadian Club of Rome luncheon. It was about six, seven months ago now, a while ago. Um, I asked her if I could um, show her slides and she said, gra gracefully said yes. So, okay, so let's go back here. Okay, so the growth rate uh, is on a per annum basis has dropped. It's almost halved. The, the peak was in 1968, it was 2.1% per annum. That, that was 73 people because it was based on less than 4 billion people. In 2010, the growth rate was 1.2% per annum, almost half of this, but the uh, number of people is now 7 billion. So that's about 81 million people, which is more than 73. So even though the growth rate is declining, um, it's a percentage of the total population at the time. And the total population at the time has grown so fast that the increment each year is still uh, is high, it's still growing. When will the human population stop growing? When the world population was going to, remember we were told the world population was going to peak about 9 mil billion, just over 9 billion, and then decline, like likely peak at 9.4 billion, about 2070, and then decline to around 9 billion by 2100, according to the projections that were in this book, World Population and Human Capital in the 21st Century. Okay, um, and then this was revised. So, world population is gonna increase 1 billion over the next 12 years, that's when it was back at 7.2, 9.6 billion by 2050, 10.9 billion by 2100, and growth continuing after 2100. Population of developed regions unchanged about 1.3 billion from now to 2050, but the population of the 49 least developed countries, LDCs, will double from 900 million to 1.8 billion. Okay, so here's some UN numbers from June of 2017. Population 7.6 billion. By 2030, 8.6, 2050, 9.8, 2100, 11.9 .9 billion, it's still growing. Most of the global increase is from just nine countries, India, Nigeria, um, Democratic uh, Republic of Congo, uh, Pakistan, Ethiopia, Tanzania, USA, Uganda, Indonesia. The 47 least developed countries average 4.3 births per woman fertility rate. That's averaged over 2010 to 15. That's growing 2.5% per year. Okay, so what happened? Why, why are the projections so much more higher now? So this is showing the old projections in the dashed line the, for the global, okay, peaking about 9.2 by 2070 and then dropping. Now what's happened is the Africa, the old projection was here. Instead, the new projection is much, much higher for Africa. Okay, slightly higher for Asia and uh, lower, slightly lower uh, for Latin America and North America, etc. So you add all these up and the new projection is much, much higher. So the big, huge difference is in Africa. Fertility rates in Africa have not been dropping. Okay, large and unanticipated rise in Africa's future population accounts for almost the entire increase in the new 2100 global projection. Okay, uh, you know, if you take climate change into account um, and you have uh, James Lovelock's projection is a billion by 
2100. Um, you know, these projections, they basically, as business as usual, it's that uh, there's enough food, there's enough uh, water, there's enough uh, space, there's lack of nuclear war, lack of huge uh, massive wars or huge famines that would call the population. So these are all the, the rosy picture, rosy if you like, I mean, it's a horrifying scenario to have a world with that many people. Um, I mean, the stresses are bad enough now. Um, so, this is the Sub-Saharan Sub Africa published in 2004 and 2015. The population projections going out to 2100. Here we have 2 billion and here we have 4 billion, almost double. Okay, so the 2015 projection for Sub-Saharan Africa, enormous. Okay, so that's the difference in those, those numbers. You know, what's happening in Sub-Saharan Africa and some of these other, um, should be LDCs, least developed countries, the world downplayed the importance of population growth, focused on AIDS, education, development. Preferred family sizes remain high, little effort to counter the cultural norms of high fertility. Access to contraception did increase, but there are many misconceptions about the harm it caught, about, about it causing harm, preventing its use. So stuff was available, but wasn't used. So the population is upward, rocketing upward. Um, there's something called demographic transition theory, DTT. Um, and this was the, I, this made people complacent. It was basically the population would deal with itself. You know, with sustainable development and economic growth in developing countries, social equity, environmental protection, that people would become wealthier and therefore they would have less kids, okay? Um, this would happen on its own, right? But in reality, how can these things be achieved without controlling population growth? The demographic transition, of course, people would automatically have fewer children. So that's just not... Uh, it's just not, not what's happening. The population is still skyrocketing. There was a, an international conference on population and development, ICPD, Cairo 1994. It implemented this model, the idea that population growth would be reduced indirectly by economic growth, sustainable development, education, especially for girls, gender equity and equality, infant, child and maternal mortality reduction, reproductive health services have, with universal access, family planning, you know, and the idea, the statement that came out of this um, conference, all couples and individuals have the basic right to decide freely and responsibly the number and spacing of their children and have the information, education, and means to do so. Okay, um, they, they did recognize back then that rapid population growth in developing countries would put great pressure on the environment. Large proportion of young people in those countries would result in extremely rapid population growth at current fertility rates. This growth would put enormous social and environmental problems, uh, pressure. But it didn't recommend any measures to specifically reduce population growth. It didn't promote, for example, small families through government education programs. You know, and one environmental problem that now gets almost all the attention is climate change. And, uh, you know, I focus mostly on climate change because that's my area of expertise. But I do recognize population overshoot and population growth is having enormous impacts on climate change. For example, what of these things is not affected by human numbers? Industrial production drives climate change. Food production drives climate change. Resource depletion, pollution, habitat and biodiversity loss. They're all affected by population. They're all affected by the number of humans on the planet. Okay, um, big time. You know, uh, has consumption growth or population growth driven emissions growth? Well, both right the the effect on the environment the number effect on the emissions is population times um consumption but if you just plot um emissions according to the ipcc versus population according to the un they track almost uh almost overlap word for word line for line year for year okay so population is 
a huge impact. Now, in terms of Canada, uh, being where I'm from, what are we doing to stabilize population? Here we are right now, about 2018, we're close to 35 million and we're projected to go uh, at, you know, at, at, at a uh, good clip higher. We're deliberately driving our population growth through immigration. So here, this is a Canadian um, data. This is, this is showing, this is the immigration share of population growth. Okay, so this, the proportion of Canada's growth from immigration between 1992 and 2017 is um, 75%. Okay, so most of our population growth 75% of it right now, or recently, is from immigration. We grew by 1.2% over the last year, nearly double the U.S. rate of 0.7%. Okay, so, so the immigration to populate Canada. Now, there's some calculation. Um, this guy did some calculations on greenhouse gas emissions. So one barrel of oil from Alberta oil sands produces about a tenth of a ton of carbon dioxide okay current with production levels of 2 million barrels a day that would be 200,000 tons of co2 per day over a year that's 73 megatons in a year now our emissions in canada went from 590 megatons per year in 1990 to 740 in 2015 we increased the difference here is 150 megatons per year increase which is twi twice the average annual output from the oil sands Okay, but the per capita rate of emissions hasn't changed because our population has risen rapidly. So we're still about 20 tons per person, which is among the highest in the world. Um, we've had 6 million newcomers since 1990 with a population of 35 million. Now, without those newcomers, we'd be at 29 million. Um, the, the present policies will drive our population to 100 million by 2100. At 100 million, our greenhouse gas emissions would triple to 2,000 megatons. To get back, you know, how are we possibly gonna, gonna reduce them? There's a problem here. Uh, Houston, we have a problem. You know, uh, so uh, this is, uh, so, so why growing, according to the Population Institute of Canada, why are growing our population through immigration is a bad idea. We don't need more people, we're high energy consumers, that 20 tons per person, high energy and high greenhouse gas producers, our environment and farm, farmland are under pressure. We hurt other countries. We're taking the best and brightest from other countries. These other countries need them more than we do to grow their economies, to, to increase the way of life for people that are staying, still in those other countries. We're providing a safety valve for other countries that, that should be controlling their own population growth. Um, Remittances from expats in rich countries. Um, lots of people that immigrate here, they send money back to their home countries. Like uh, the Philippines, Haiti, Egypt, they export 10% of their population. They send 10% they of their population is exported, um, right? Which is huge numbers. And lots of those people that are in other countries and they send money back to the countries which uh, Remittances remove the money from the economy of the country they work with. This, this, the, the growth paradigm cannot work indefinitely. Okay, here's, here's what uh, Madeline said. Those who think we should grow Canada's population should be sent to live here up in the Arctic, I guess. Can you think of any problem on any scale from microscopic to global whose long-term solution is in any demonstrable way aided, assisted, or advanced by having continued population growth at the local level, the state level, the national level, or globally. It's good for the economy, right? It ensures that GDP rises. One of the big factors for GDP rise of a couple percent a year is the population growth of a percent plus per year, right? But economists never tell you that. They say, oh, we're doing great. The economy is doing great. Okay, so population growth is a raging monster upon the land. Okay, the flourishing of human life and culture is, is compatible with a substantial decrease in the human population. If we want to maintain things, the flourishing of non-human life requires such a decrease. Okay, there's no global population problem. The problem is within each country. Thank you.